Good well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's GA Wednesday seminar. Um, my name is Andrew Feitz, and I'm the Director for Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice here at GA. And um, yeah, it's my pleasure, pleasure to welcome you here. Um, look, Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional onion, um, owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Marita Bradshaw, um, who will be giving today's talk. Uh, Marita is a very experienced um, uh, geologist with over 40 years experience in both uh, industry and government. Um, and you would have to say that she is really a pioneer geoscience in this building. She's a really fantastic um, scientist that, to, to come back and uh, work with us. I actually bumped into Marita at a conference last year. And at that conference, we had a big map of all the hydrogen projects across the country and where we think are the best places to um, produce hydrogen. And on that map, we had locations of where there could be potentially salt that we could use for salt caverns. Marita comes up to the map and she goes, oh, but you know, there's some salt up there and there's some salt down there. There could be some salt over there, which we didn't have on our maps. And I said, OK, Marita, we need your help. <laughs> so Marita very graciously came out of retirement to work with my team. And it's been a really an absolute pleasure to have you working with us. Um, Marita is um, also a steering committee member of the National Rock Garden. She might give a plug for that later in the talk. But anyway, um, Rita, please come. The stadium is yours, and we will, stadium. The stage is yours, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone here and online. Um, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you today about hydrogen and salt. There we are. So I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the elders past, present and emerging, and just take a moment to think about these are the cultures and the people that have been custodians here for tens of thousands of years before the last ice age, into that ice age and out the other side, and then through colonization much to learn there. And I particularly want to acknowledge all the fun people I've had the terrific opportunity to work with. It's been terrific. I've really enjoyed it all. So there's some of the happy faces and hopefully I've captured everyone there. So everyone's helped me so much and made me so welcome. It's just a joy to come to work. So thank you all. Uh, this work is part of the Exploring for the Future program where GA has gone out and looked for all sorts of different commodities. And as the hydrogen game has started to kick off, salts become important, which is sort of the thing that's got my interest. So just to set the context, energy has always been the biggest game in town, whether it was horsepower, manpower back in ancient history, or the coal which stoked the Industrial Revolution and put us on this current trajectory, or the oil that really dominated the 20th century as far as economies and politics. Uh, and now we're going into a brave new world with a much more diverse energy system. But as you can see, we've continued to use more and more energy. Uh, and of course, one of the major drivers of that is actually growth in population, but indeed the energy intensity has increased more rapidly than population. So we're all living these wonderful lifestyles, but there are some unintended consequences. When the old guys replaced whale oil with petroleum, they thought they were doing a good thing, and they were. There's plenty of whales now. But, uh, <laughs> but you've always got to think the whole system through. So let's look at Australia's energy use. So very similar to the global one, dominated by coal, gas and oil, though indeed the stationary energy uses of coal truly has started to decline and renewables are increasing. Still, the biggest slice of our energy use in Australia is actually for transport. 
as we're all running around and, you know, shifting stuff up and down on roads. So that's a, a major energy use. And then there's all the use of energy in industry. Uh, the other part of Australia's energy use is that we are a major energy exporter, not only uranium, of course, but coal and gas. And indeed, our export, if you measure it in energy terms, in petajoules, is more than three times our domestic consumption. So that's the energy picture for Australia. And uh, how can we uh, move forward into a new energy mix, given these demands on the energy we need? Well, one of the things, and I don't think I need to belabor this today, we're all fully aware of this, that uh, use of these particular fuel mix has added to more CO2 in the atmosphere, which we've seen climbing, and indeed to increases in global temperature and to particular dramatic weather events. We even had one yesterday. Uh, and so I think what I'm trying to say in this slide is there's a real urgency now to shift the energy mix and, you know, whether we can take those trajectories down globally uh, to zero emissions by 2050 is an incredible challenge. Um, are we up to it? But. Uh, so that brings us to hydrogen and salt. Part of the part of the solution, I think, only a small part of the jigsaw, but an interesting one. So what I'll talk about this morning is why hydrogen, why salt? And we're talking about the underground storage of hydrogen in salt caverns. And so the questions are, how does salt, how do salt accumulations form? Where's the salt in Australia? And how do we find some more? All sorts of geological questions which Geoscience Australia is well uh, suited to answer. So why hydrogen? Well, it can really operate as an energy carrier and as long-term storage, may even have a role in grid stabilisation. And it's particularly suited for those hard to electrify uses and as a direct chemical feedstock. And there's even an option that we can consider it as an energy export, either as hydrogen or uh, transported as ammonia, or indeed in embodied energy products. You know, if we follow the pathway to producing our own green steel, green iron, green aluminium. A tremendous opportunity there for Australia if we can get all the parts of the puzzle to operate. Uh, we also must think, well, are there any unintended consequences, any things we really need to be aware of? And at the recent uh, hydrogen conference, some of the things that emerged were safety, obviously, but, you know, hydrogen is a, a hazardous product, but no more so than other ones that we use all the time. Fugitive emissions, still an issue. And then the question of water use. So these are issues to consider, but all um, achievable to have a balance that that will work, I hope. And the thing I like about the hydrogen, it will provide diversity and resilience in the energy system. Uh, I don't think we can fully go on electricity for everything, but having another string to the bow is really so important. And of course, it's already underway. Some houses in Australia already have a bit of hydrogen in their gas supply. The first cargo of hydrogen's already gone to Japan. and. Uh, you know, the use is accelerating elsewhere. So the bit of the puzzle we've been working on is the hydrogen storage. And we're talking about hydrogen storage underground rather in the big tank. And because so much of the hydrogen system can in fact be underground, both in the pipes and the storage, that gives you the added resilience in the energy system as we have these compounding and cascading climate or weather events. So that's another reason to consider hydrogen. And let's look at hydrogen storage. So this graph just sort of maps uh, the amount of hydrogen or energy you can store and how much it costs you to store it. The sort of energy storage we're really familiar with is the large battery. 
and you can see that's an energy equivalent to a bit over three tonnes of hydrogen, and we're measuring there over 100 megawatts. So it'll help you stabilise your grid or use uh, the energy stored there on a time scale of hours. Whereas the thing about hydrogen is you can store so much more and we're talking about long duration storage in terms of months, even longer, and relatively cheap in comparison to these other storage methods. So that brings us to why salt? Well, it's cost effective. It can be large scale and long duration energy storage. Hydrogen is basically chemically inert in a salt cavern. And salt itself is ductile, you know, so there's a high integrity in the storage. You know, the salt will move, it's sort of self-healing, it moves in the subsurface. And we have an industrial track record of many decades, both in Europe and North America, of storing natural gas in salt cabins. I know we spent many years uh, talking to our general public and uh, others about how oil and gas is not in a giant hole under the ground, but actually in tiny pores. But indeed, the hydrogen storage, the idea is to store it in a giant hole in a cabin. Uh, and as you can see there in the cartoon, what you do is you dissolve some of the salt in a diaper like that. And so you pump down fresh water, pump the salty brine out, and you have to think about how you're going to dispose of that. And then you have a large hydrogen storage container and you can pump your hydrogen down and then bring it out again when you need it. And it, this can happen for many cycles. And, you know, it's an established industry. Those pictures on the bottom, I think, are from Salzburg. So even back into medieval times, people have been storing stuff in salt caves and salt caverns. Uh, this is one of Stephanie's slides from the recent hydrogen conference, and it's just tabulating some of the data, showing that there's already four places around the world, um, in Teesside in uh, UK and also along the Gulf Coast and in Germany, where they're already storing hydrogen in the subsurface in salt. Uh, you create the cavern with solution mining and then you've got to think about your brine management and it gives you the statistics that you need for the salt you're looking for. You want a thick salt that's ideally pure halite. I'll just draw, draw your attention to that number there. So we're not talking about megawatts of energy now, we're talking about gigawatts that you can store in a salt cavern. And to me, the thing that made me think it's worth coming to work <laughs> was, no, oh no, the people and the coffee. <laughs> but truly, truly uh, this is why I think it's really worth considering. Um, These are numbers from Andrew, that Snowy 2.0, the pumped hydro, we're aiming to store approximately 350 gigawatts, whereas a couple of salt caverns in the Polder Basin could store more than that amount. So that's sort of showing you that it's about scale and to do the energy transition, it's all about scale. So I'm on team hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, met many, many, many options and we need them all. So let's get back into the salt, which I am qualified to talk about. Uh, <laughs> uh, so ideally you're looking for a domal structure and salt helps us out because it's low density material and it actually moves in the subsurface, forming domes and diapers. And you want pure halite and that becomes an interesting factor and that really uh, narrows down the search of what geological environment we're looking for. Uh, problem is if you have a bit of sulphur there, you can get uh, biological activity, which can make H2S and plus it tends to eat your hydrogen. You need to have the salt at a particular depth range, it's all to do with the confining pressure of the hydrogen in the subsurface. So we know salt can move in the subsurface and it creates structures. In fact, those diapers, they look perfect for creating a cylindrical cavern to store your hydrogen in. 
And as it moves, it actually disrupts and can incorporate other rocks. So a really interesting research question, I think, is what's happening with these post-depositional processes? Sometimes the salt can actually clean itself up by flowing because the halite tends to move faster than the other evaporites, but also it can contaminate itself as it moves. So whether there's some sort of seismic imagery to really look inside the salt body and see where's a good clean one and where's a one that looks a bit uh, contaminated. And of course, before you create a cavern, you would really want to drill a hole and really log carefully what your salt body looks like. So how, so we've talked about why hydrogen and why salt, and now we get down to the geological bit. So how do salt de deposits form? I've got that little hopper crystal there, which is out of the hardy sandstone, I think, you know, two billion or older rock from the Pilbara. So salt's been around for a long, long time. Uh, and that's to remind me to say we're talking about marine evaporites. To get these kilometres of halite that we need, you've got to have a major brine source, which is indeed the ocean. There's plenty of salt deposits around. You see them in Central Australia, you see them in the Alta Plano, in Tibet, in non-marine systems, but they're usually not giving you the thick halite we're really looking for. So we're focusing on marine evaporites. And this cartoon there shows that if you take a kilometre of seawater, and evaporated under the hot sun, what you're left with is only 17 metres of evaporites. But most of that will in fact be halite, which is what we're looking for. So I think it might be time to release the rocks. Uh, so we're going to look at some of these evaporite minerals, some gypsum. Uh, so as you evaporate your pile of seawater, when you're down to only you know a puddle left you'll start to have gypsum crystals grow and some of those are coming round and the other thing that tends to happen is is the gypsum brine seeps into the units underneath and actually crystals grow within the soft sediment and you'll see one of the samples coming round the shells that were previously there in the bottom of the of the marine embayment have actually been incorporated in big gypsum crystals. So once you've got the carbonate and the gypsum out, you're left with your puddle and mostly what it deposits is halite, which is what we're looking for. So that, so if you uh, evaporate your column of seawater, you mostly end up with halite. And then if it goes to the final complete evaporation, you get potash salts, which are often what uh, people have looked for in the past, but highlights what we're looking for in um, hydrogen storage. Right, so what are the patterns of salt deposition? Well, there's two major types. You can have what you see there at the top, sort of the teardrop pattern. You have a little marine embayment at the edge of the ocean uh, with a you know tiny inlet. And what you'll see is the salt flat rimming the edge of that basin and usually only a thin amount of salt deposit is deposited there. But if you have a basin that you totally close off from the ocean but somehow still get seawater in there, you'll end up with a big puddle of salt right in the deep bottom of the basin and that's how you create these really thick kilometres of salt which we see in the geological record. Just to uh, show you more of the geometry we're talking about. We're now looking at slices through these sort of environments. And you can see the common one you see is on the edge of the ocean, you'll have these salt flats. And there you only get, you know, 10 metres or so of halide at the most deposited in between lots of other units that you're not really that interested in. But if somehow, if you can get a deep basin, lock it off from the ocean, uh, evaporate it down, but still continue to get seawater in, perhaps through a cave system or a waterfall or some, some peculiar arrangement, you'll then build up kilometres of halite, which has happened in the past. So for underground hydrogen storage, this is what we want. 
patterns on the bottom. And the tricky thing is there's been no, there are no modern examples of this depositional environment occurring now, which has always been an issue for geologists of how do these thick salts form in the past? We saw the, the statistics there, you got to <laughs> evaporate a kilometre of seawater and you end up with a few tens of metres of evaporites. How do we do this? Well, there is an example from a short while ago in geological time, from five million years ago, uh, when the Mediterranean basically dried out. And the idea is that seawater still got in from the Atlantic. There was even talk about a Gibraltar waterfall, or perhaps it was largely underground seepage. And from seismic and drilling data, we know that there's these large, extensive salt deposits at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Uh, these were revealed by the deep sea drilling project in the 1970s, and it really opened people's eyes and established a whole new model of how you could get thick salts deposited. And it explains a lot of features that you see. Uh, the fact that rivers like the Rhone and the Danube are all cut deeply into their valleys because they were cutting down to a a much lower base level when the whole Mediterranean was just a series of puddles of salt lake, at, you know, kilometres down. So that's been the dominant model. But it's been wonderful to come back and work on this stuff again. I've come back to other parts of geology, you know, 20 years later and things haven't moved on. But boy, this place, this particular sort of geology has moved on. And again, this is how science works. Whole, whole lot of new information's come out of the subsalt drilling offshore Brazil and it's led to some new models of how large salt deposits may indeed form. And this is one of them. Uh, the idea is it's actually a hydrothermal model for creating thick salt deposits at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the more I've read about this, the more confused and excited I've become. <laughs> This is another area for research. It's uh, really exciting, I think. And the thing that Chris Borum and I are excited about is that this serpentinized uh, situation is how you can create a big source of natural hydrogen. So can we put the elements of the hydrogen play together with a source, the seal of the salt? I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I'll leave that there. That's uh, that's just an interesting thing, I think. But what do we know? <laughs> we do know where the salt is in Australia. So let's look at that and where we can make some firmer predictions. So where is the salt and what does that tell us about the controls of tectonics and climate on where the salt is in Australia? Well, we have salt deposits going right back to over 700 million years ago, right through to only a few thousand years ago at Lake McLeod. But the dominant period for depositing salt in Australia was before uh, 350 million years ago. So we'll first look at these Tonian salts in the Neo-Proterozoic about 700 million years ago or a bit earlier. So this is a map which shows you all the basins where we have the Centralian Super Basin, a big Neo-Proterozoic extensive uh, depositional area. And in the pink boxes where we know we definitely have Neo-Proterozoic salt. In the middle of Central Australia in the Amadeus, in the Officer Basin there in Western Australia, and down offshore in the Polder Basin, uh, which comes into the Eyre Peninsula. And we also believe we have salt just across to the west on trend with the Polder Basin in the Bremer Subbasin. Never been drilled, but on the seismic we see features which really look like salt diapers. And this is work from Barry Bradshaw way back when we were doing all that stuff on the Bremer. Yes. Anyway, so let's look at the polder because this is where we definitely drill the salt. We know it's there. We're now able to look at some terrific cutting samples that the repository has kept since the 1980s. The Mercury one was drilled and there's, you know, a kilometre of salt in Mercury one. Just an ideal sort of thing to perhaps make a underground storage in. So, 
thing. There we are. So this is a, a cartoon of what it could possibly look like. That offshore, you actually, you know, create the salt cavern by pumping down fresh water, extracting the brine, leaving a big hole, and then you put down your hydrogen, which you perhaps generate with renewable energy, even offshore wind. Now, these sort of projects are already definitely on the drawing board elsewhere. And uh, I think it's a, an interesting one. Now I'll leave that one there. And I'll look at another salt, another one of these neoproterozoic tonian salts, the Gillen Formation in the Amadeus Basin in Central Australia. There it is, that pink squiggly thing, you know, it's moving in the subsurface, uh, pushing up these diapers. And again, we were able to go down to the repository and find Mount Charlotte number one, which was drilled way back in the 60s when we were looking for oil and gas and some beautiful salt there. Um, but you can see that salt is combined with little chips of carbonate. So it's obviously moved and incorporated other units in it. And if you look at the crystals, they are sort of interlocking. So this is sort of telling you something about the GM mechanics of how salt moves. And that's another uh, important research area, I think. And I think people at Curtin Uni are, are on to that. So let's step look, look at this uh, late uh, Proterozoic time interval uh, when it is the large, it is the most extensive salt deposition interval in Australia. So I think many opportunities for underground salt storage in these very old rocks in Australia. And very exciting things are happening in the Neoproterozoic. Uh, after the salt deposition, we have the snowball earth episode when, you know, supposedly there were glaciers or, you know, ice caps over almost the entire earth. And one of the intriguing ideas which has been put forward is, was it the increased albedo of all those glittering salt lakes, not only in Australia, but in the other continents in the late Proterozoic, which actually triggered the big freeze that then happened? That's an idea of Susanna Schmidt at uh, CSIRO, and I like it. So these are some of her maps and also Lee's reconstruction. So this is the Earth you know, about 800 million years ago. And you can see all the continents are gathered together in the Rodinia supercontinent, and they're starting to break apart. And really it's this breakup of the continent which produces these deep holes that you can accumulate the salt in. And also if you see where Australia is and the other parts of Rodinia, those pink areas on the, on the, on the map show where the evaporites are they're around the equator so they're in the hot climate ideal for evaporating seawater to make salt so that's a key interval i think the tonian but now we'll look at the paleozoic uh, moving forward a bit and at this time australia has these seaways which crisscross it and we do have salt deposited uh, there we've got an example from the canning basin but that particular example, you know, there's not much salt. There's a hell of a lot of red mud in there with it. So again, the salts move and incorporated things. Uh, I think Donna Cathro looked at all these rocks last century, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, we know we have these salts of Cambrian, perhaps into early Silurian age, in the Amadeus, in the Canning Basin for sure, in the Carnarvon and also offshore in the Bonaparte Basin. And the real question is, you know, what sort of marine connections are and where are the deep holes we can make a thick salt deposit? I think most of the deposition we see at this time is actually carbonate platforms, this sort of setup, rather than the deep holes with a thick salt. But there are some places where it did happen in the Amadeus and in the Canning. So that's another uh, important unit where you could start looking for salt in the early Paleozoic across Australia. And now we come to the Devonian, where we do have a very nice salt deposit in eastern Australia in the Adaval Basin. Now, by the Devonian, Australia is starting to head south. 
but we still have marine embayments on the east and the west. And um, eventually Australia will end up over the South Pole and way out of the zone where you would get thick marine salts. But the Ada Vale Basin's got the thick salt in it. So the next question is, where else can we find thick salts of Devonian age? And is the Darling Basin a potential there in Western New South Wales? because like the Ada Vale, it's sort of in a place where it'd be useful to have some hydrogen storage. Which brings us back to even more ancient history, again from last century, uh, when we did the Paleogeographic Map Project. And these are maps up the top there from uh, the Devonian. And I never liked this map. I always thought it looked rather strange to have that marine incursion from the south coast or from Antarctica basically, all the way up into the Georgina Basin to explain the occurrence of these Devonian fish. And I think the one, the uh, paleogeography at the bottom there is a much better interpretation of how it probably happened. So I think the Darling Basin is another place to look at and see if we can find any analog to the Ada Vale along that convergent margin in Eastern Australia. So it's all about getting back to the paleogeographies and uh, even what the Devonian fish can tell us. A little bit more information about the Ada Vale. Uh, we've already been able to work from um, Gus and Carmine, big team working on the Ada Vale. We can recognise several salt units and very nice, you know, hundreds of metres of pure halite, just what we're looking for. And we were able to look at the terrific cores down in the repository and start to see what are they telling us about the salt. I think some of the things there in that very number one, I can see what appears to me to be primary fabric of the salt. Uh, so I'll, perhaps you'll be able to uh, make those interpretations yourself if you've looked at the rocks that were passed around. Uh, but the bulk of the unit you see is again these large interlocking crystals of halite. Again, it's when the salts moved and it's pressure solved against each other. And then the overlying units, because the diapers come up and displaced and brecciated them all, you get these incredible, uh, you know, <laughs> terrazzo, it almost looks like, all stuck together in the units above. So again, the geomechanics and really understanding your salt body is a, is a key part of the process. Right, so we've talked about why hydrogen, why salts, how salt may form, where the salt is. Now let's go on to where we can find some more, which is the real strong suit of this organisation. I think there's a role for looking at the fundamental geological setting, you know, the tectonics, the climate, the paleogeography. I think, you know, the structural understanding is quite key because you want these deep holes. And then reconnaissance geophysics, both seismic, airborne magnetics, perhaps gravity. So let's have a look at what some of the work we've done. This is work from Mike and uh, Sebastian, Wayne, Malcolm and others looking at these diapyric features that are way out there in the officer basin. You can see them on the seismic there in the blue. And then the idea is what can we see in the AEM that might indeed collaborate and help us expand our uh, view further? Because the AEM goes a lot further than the seismic and is uh, easier to uh, acquire. So this is an example of uh, the seismic up against the AEM. And you can see that there's places where you can see the correlation between a diapyric feature and a blip in the AEM, such as there at the Woolno diaper. And then there's other features in the AEM that you don't have seismic for, and then other features in the seismic that you don't have AEM for. So a uh, an area for a lot of uh, further work. So the other thing I thought of, of Reconnaissance geochemistry, whether that can point to marine, thick marine salts in the subsurface. And I read with great detail uh, the work by the Salt, Salt Lake group here. And there certainly are areas like Lake Frome where there's indications in the modern hydrogeochemistry that there might be 
ancient salts at depth, which would fit with the uh, Adelaide foal belt. Uh, but everywhere where, the, where it sort of is indicated, we already knew there was salt there. So it's sort of a circular argument at this stage, but really I think that deserves more attention and there's more information to be dug out of the hydrogeochemistry. I'd be interested to hear what people think of that. Right, so I'll conclude now because I'd like lots of questions. So we do have thick halite. Uh, we have the toolkit to go and find more of it. And it really is a place to repurpose our incredible data sets, you know, the digital stuff that we've got on the portal and plus the physical samples which are here and elsewhere in Australia to really understand, you know, what was the depositional environment of the salt and more importantly, what's happened to it post deposition. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take some questions.